Hi there, my name is Ken Mayer and I'm going to be your instructor for this course on computing fundamentals. So in the last 30 years, I've had the opportunity to work with a variety of different operating systems, some that aren't even around in today's world. Of course, eventually we moved into uh, the personal computer and working with something we call the disk operating system. Certainly worked from there through shell commands to uh, install hardware, to install the uh, software, to even building some of these computers uh, from scratch. I then continued to move and follow along with the different operating systems that came out. And out came this thing called Windows. And of course, I followed the Windows family all the way through to the current Windows 8. I worked with other network operating systems, such as Novell. And outside of the operating systems, I've also worked in the arena of the networking infrastructure, working with uh, some of the biggest vendors for the uh, routing and switching markets, for the security and firewall markets. Also have a hand at doing a lot of audits to uh, work with uh, what we call security or sometimes ethical hacking. And so I hope that with this foundation over the last 30 years, with all the things I'm still doing as a consultant, that I'll be able to share that information with you in a way that makes it very easy for you to understand how uh, the computing fundamentals work and to be able to get you going in the world of computing. So in this module, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of your operating systems. And so what we'll do is, of course, describe what an operating system is, how we can uh, basic, uh, do some of the basic configurations of the operating systems, and then introduce what an application is and how that's different than an operating system. And then, of course, with all of that, we're going to talk about how the hardware and the software, both applications and operating systems, are going to work together. And then we're going to look at some of the fundamental settings that uh, you can use and control to make the operating system more convenient for you, to make you more productive through the use of something like the control panel that you see in Windows. So let's start off by talking about what an operating system is. So what we'll do is we'll cover how applications and hardware work together with an operating system. I'm going to go back a little bit in history to let you know where we were and why uh, having a, an operating system like Windows is so useful for us now. That means I'll also talk about some of the common operating system features, get into uh, the ability to cruise through your files and your uh, folders through the directory infrastructure, also talk about uh, the needs to keep an operating system up to date through patches and other types of updates. So I want to talk first a little bit about the history, and you're going to hear me repeat this over uh, a few times, just to make sure that we're uh, clear about the uh, importance of an operating system. In the old days, the operating system, well, even today, is supposed to be a way of uh, interacting between you, the user, and the uh, hardware, like maybe a printer that's uh, connected to your computer. I like to make computers look like laptops. So basically, you're interacting with the uh, operating system that is in control of the functions of what the computer does. Part of that control means that it's operating and working with different peripherals. That's what we call uh, different dev uh, hardware devices that we attach to a computer. And it could be like a printer, uh, or of course, it could be like a, a mouse that we connect, or the keyboards, even though I drew a laptop a lot of keyboard in there. So when we started this work, we needed to have a way to be able to physically implement commands. We wanted to be able to take our actions that, uh, that we want the uh, hardware to, to uh, take uh, to happen through the operating system. And the way we did it in the old days is we had what was called the disk operating system. Now, the disk operating system, known as DOS, was designed to give us an interface, but it was through a series of commands that we uh, actually had to uh, type in here. I want to kind of reverse those. Let me make it look the right way. Uh, C colon and then the pounds or the uh, greater than sign. And so if you didn't know the commands, you were forever searching, looking through reference guides. But uh, the idea was is that we wanted to be able to uh, issue a command to have something happen. Like maybe we wanted to open up a certain program. So we had to know the what we call the path of where the program is and understand uh, some of these uh, extensions that we use that uh, kind of were coded into the commands to be able to make some program run or open up. And in those days, if a program did launch for us, it also was in a command line format that um, it often didn't have a beautiful graphical interface like we see in today's world. And the idea was is that as we continued to uh, issue different commands, maybe we wanted to uh, uh, look through the list of files that we have, so we had to memorize commands like dir for directory. And all the commands had to be eight letters or less. But it was our way of being able to interact with an operating system, and then the, that operating system could interact with the hardware. As an example, if I issued the uh, directory command, it would actually have to go to the hard drive, 
we often draw them as little cylinders, to be able to retrieve the list of files that were there, and then when that information came back, to list them for us so we knew what contents we had stored. Now, that seemed to be in the day, uh, uh, one of the cool things uh, to do with a computer is to be able to know that you had commands that you could make things happen. Well, then came the idea and concept of Windows. Certainly, we could say, uh, if any of you go back in history, that maybe Macintosh or Apple, as we call them today, had some of the first Windows and uh, not uh, necessarily for Microsoft, but I'm not going to get into that uh, age-old argument. The idea was is that we wanted to have a way to be able to uh, take actions on an operating system that would basically translate anything we did by turning them into DOS commands without us having to memorize the commands. And so what would happen now is that we would maybe see an icon, that's what we call the little pictures that are on the screens, of uh, maybe a printer. And we knew that if we could move our mouse, a little pointing device, over to that and click on it, that that would do the same thing as finding the proper DOS command to be able to actually print a, a document or a piece of paper. And so that made life uh, a lot easier for us because basically those visual commands that you would do would translate into these DOS commands and then you would uh, be, of course, much more productive because you didn't have to research, memorize, or uh, kind of, uh, you know, struggle at trying to figure out how to get certain things done. Uh, the other thing that the operating system did for us is it gave us kind of an interface to the hardware. By an interface, what I meant is in the old days, uh, if uh, we had, let's say, a command line uh, program, and remember, the command line really just uh, didn't do much for us as far as uh, being able to uh, set up uh, easy communications from one application to a piece of hardware. And so, in the old days, we bought some sort of word processing program that we would launch through the command line. We had to uh, find a way to be able to convert the data that we were typing in into something that a printer would be able to understand. And so, that was the concept of a driver. The drivers were ways of translating what we saw on the screen. So even if we saw this, uh, you know, list of Word documents or, or, you know, typed document, a letter, whatever you're creating, we had to find a way to translate that into something that each printer that we bought was capable of understanding. Some of the problems we had is that there were a variety of different printers. And so uh, if you decided to suddenly buy a new printer because maybe the old one died, then we had problems using that same program with the new printer because it may have been by a different company or had a different set of uh, instructions. Uh, and by the way, printers have their own operating systems, often called firmware, which are uh, basically loaded into the uh, uh, chips of the uh, printers that have the, all the instructions. And so we had to find a way to translate that. Drivers did that job for us. They helped us translate our output into something that the device, the hardware device that was connected to us, would be able to understand. So one of the concepts that came out of Windows, and by the way, this also made it very expensive because if you wanted to use this word processing program, the people who created that program at that time were uh, required to create drivers to talk to all of the different models and manufacturers of printers. And so that made the cost of buying this software expensive because that took a lot of work for the developers of that software to be able to create drivers for every model of printer. And even back in the days of the command line, there were a lot of vendors uh, that were out there selling printers, just like today. So one of the other ideas came up that said, you know, let's make some, this a little bit cheaper. Let's make this a little bit easier and come up with this common interface between the two, the operating systems and the hardware. So here came the concept of Windows. I know I'm drawing lots of little screens for you. So Windows came up, Microsoft, with this idea that said, look, what you can do is you can create a program, like a word processing program, and all it has to do is be able to talk to Windows. And what we'll do is we'll require everybody who builds a printer to be able to create their own driver that could talk to Windows. That way, the development of the software was much cheaper and and some of you might say, well, I've seen some expensive software, but certainly it depends on the functionality and how complex it was to develop. But all we had to do was make sure that the applications talked to Windows and that the uh, hardware devices would talk to Windows, and Windows would do that translation for us 
in communicating from the uh, content, let's say again of a word processor, to the uh, driver that uh, would then communicate to the print device. And that made life so much simpler it, all the way around because uh, we didn't have to worry about the complexities of trying to be able to match all of the different hardware that was out there. All we had to do was write programs that worked with Windows. Now one of the things that, uh, that you're going to see in the discussion we have is just uh, what do file extensions mean to us. And, uh, and this again is a part of how applications and hardware kind of work together uh, with an operating system. But the idea was is that uh, we wanted a way to, again, to make this easier. If I wanted to open a file, and I was back over here doing this directory command, and I saw a list of files, in order for me to open the file, I had to first open a program, and then from that program, reference the file that I wanted to have opened. And that file might not have even been compatible with the uh, communications of that application. In other words, you might have made the wrong association of which program you thought would open a certain uh, file that you have. So another concept that we have of extensions, sometimes called associations, is that we found a way to be able to mark each file that we create with a program. And uh, that process made it, again, easy for us in the operating system to be able to open up our content and our files. As an example, if I had a file and all I saw was the name file, how would I know what that's supposed to open with? Again, it would be a guessing game. And so we came up with a concept of putting a period at the end of each of these files and putting what we call an extension. And uh, for the most part, the extensions used to be just three letters in length. And, uh, and that was also, by the way, because file names could only be a total of 11 characters in length. And so it was uh, the combination of what you named it and the, uh, and the extension. Now, of course, they can be much longer than that. Uh, anyway, uh, so what we said is we said, okay, now, Operating says this, if somebody opens a file with a .doc as an extension, we're going to associate anything that ends in the .doc with something like Microsoft Word or maybe WordPad so that we know that when we try to open that file, instead of having to first figure out which program to open it with, that we could then just say, okay, you can open the file, the operating system will take care of opening the right application. So there's a number of uh, different types of extensions that you might see. Some like XLS would be one that would uh, open up with a spreadsheet program uh, like Excel. And, uh, and by the way, these are things you can always change. Uh, some that are a little dangerous, if you're not sure what they are, are .exes. Those are system files, extensions, that uh, in this case is an executable. That would be a, a, a actual how I would open an application. If I wanted to open up Microsoft Word, I would actually find it named word.exe. So uh, basically we'll call those applications or apps that uh, would open up. Uh, some things might add automation and actually make changes, good or bad, to our system. In the old days, we used to have what were called batch files, which uh, were scripts. Today we uh, use VB scripts a lot. And so again, there's a number of these uh, little system files and extensions that uh, were designed to actually change the way in which applications or the operating system would behave. So the more you know about the file extensions, the better off you are at understanding which uh, applications are going to open by their associations. And, uh, and again, knowing that the extensions are important when you do create a document, because uh, you know if I wanted to, I could change an extension, any of us could, but then you might break the functionality of that file. You can always fix it, name it back again, but uh, just as long as you understand what uh, the goal is. And so, again, um, what we're seeing, though, is that we use the operating system to work with applications and our files. And, of course, as I talked about with drivers, to be able to talk to the different types of hardware that are uh, connected to the uh, computer, to be able to make it all still happen centrally in the operating system. That's why I said originally the operating system was your link to the computer and to the attached hardware. And uh, that's what you would interact with to be able to open an application or, like I said, to print a document or if you have uh, something like a barcode scanner to be able to work with that uh, or the mouse and the keyboards. All of those usually require some sort of driver. So as I said, in the old days of the command line interface, which is what we originally had and still have in, to, in today's present world, it was a, a tricky method of being able to navigate to understand the commands because they uh, def definitely didn't always have user-friendly names. 
even by today's standard, ma many of these commands in the command line interface are limited to an eight letter word. So you can imagine that if I wanted to uh, know how to open server manager as an example, then you'd have to guess, well, what was the acronym? Because we're not, I can't type server manager. Is it SRV, MNGR, or something like that? It was, like I said, the navigation was tricky. Even doing something as simple as creating a new directory uh, or changing the current directory that you want to look inside uh, was uh, something that was uh, tough to do. And if you did run a program, you could only one, run that one program at a time. If you wanted to run two applications or programs at the same time, we couldn't do that. We had to close the one we were no longer using, open up the next one. So it made even the productivity so much less. So not only was the, the navigation of the command lines, what we call the hierarchy of the command lines, uh, difficult, but also was trying to be as productive as we could. I already mentioned that uh, th those applications were expensive because the people that made the applications wanted you to buy their applications, but there's no way they would know did you have an, a Hewlett Packard printer or uh, any of the existing printers back in those days. They didn't know which one you were going to buy, and so they either had to uh, just say, if you want to buy this uh, software, you got to use this printer, uh, which might not be what people want to do, uh, or they had to drive or create all those drivers to be able to interact with all the hardware that you might be using. So again, the new idea of the operating system was to be in the middle of that communication problem, to be able to help translate all of those commands that you put into the operating system into those uh, command lines. We, the CLI, by the way, stood for the command line interface, to be able to turn them into the command lines that told the operating system what to do. And that still happens today behind the scenes. Even though we don't see the command line interface, we still, you know, one mouse click from you might actually execute hundreds of lines of commands to be able to get the functionality that you want. And again, the new idea was saying, all right, you just have to work with the uh, program. The program just has to work with the operating system. And then we make sure that the hardware talks to the operating system. So in the center of all of this was the operating system to help communicate between the applications and with the hardware. And that idea did drive down a lot of the cost of software programs. Uh, you can imagine if you find some of these programs now to be expensive, how much more expensive they would be if the people making them had to uh, make sure they could work with all of the different hardware devices that you have attached to your computer or attached to your network. So what the modern operating system gave us was a visual interface, something we call the graphical user interface. And the idea behind that was to give you a consistent look and feel. The consistency was that uh, when you opened a window or an application that was uh, in a window, that it worked the same way. The way you could close the window or exit the application or make the window larger or smaller or resize the windows, to be able to have a menu of consistent commands, uh, that was something we looked for so that we didn't have to worry about how to, to uh, figure out how to use any particular application. As an example, and I don't mean this in a bad way, there was a very common uh, word processing program used before GUIs came around, which was uh, called WordPerfect. It was a great program, still is a great program. But they used to have to give you a template that you would put on top of your keyboard. And if you wanted to print, you had to remember if it was the F7 key, or it was holding the Shift button down hitting the F7 key, or if it was the Control and the Shift and the F8 key, or all of these different commands. And if you didn't see your first set of commands, you had to flip this little chart open and flip through several pages of charts to find the command you wanted in the keyboard shortcuts. And so then if you wanted to go to uh, Microsoft Word, uh, you didn't have that same flip chart. And so that's where consistency became a big part of the graphical user interface. So that now, most every application you see has a little picture of a printer. We call, again, we call it an icon. You click on that and it prints for you. You don't have to worry about memorizing all of these different commands for different programs and it helps you in being able to know how to uh, transition from different applications. So that's what we looked for in the, op in the graphical user interface was getting that, what again I call the consistency for the look and the feel and the way it worked. Now again, the modern operating system again gave us the drivers for the operating system from the hardware manufacturers. I've talked enough about printers, but there's other devices you might connect. 
Uh, again, another device might be is something I use as a present uh, in the presentation world is a little device I can click on to go from one slide to the next slide in my uh, PowerPoint presentations. And so I had to have a driver that talked to the operating system so it could, uh, again, actually act as an input device and send a message in that the operating system understood and then the operating system could say, oh, I know what that command's supposed to be on this application. So that communication with drivers actually went both directions. It just depended on whether or not we were sending information into the operating system from hardware or sending the commands out of the operating system to hardware. And it also simplified the setup of hardware because now we don't have to go through all of the uh, work we did in the command line area especially to be able to introduce or to set up uh, different devices of hardware because all we need now is usually just some sort of CD or DVD that has all of the instructions to uh, set up the communications. And so it simplified not only the consistency again of the uh, way in which windows look, but also the consistency in how we can set up hardware. It was, uh, it, it's really made this world more productive in what we can do in working with the, co uh, the uh, computers. And it doesn't make it as a difficult task to learn how to use computers because you know that once you understand how, what Windows looks like or if you're using a different operating system, as long as you know how it works and you have that consistency, it doesn't matter what type of computer you buy. It doesn't matter if you bought an HP computer or a Dell computer or a Samsung or any of these other d uh, vendors of computers. All you need to know is how the operating system works and everything else is handled in the back end. Now every operating system has some common features that are important to us. Uh, most of these are in common to almost every type that you might think of. First of all, if the computer's turned off, at some point you turn it on, it's going to go through a startup routine. That startup routine was designed to be able to check the internal hardware of the computer to make sure everything was working just fine, to find the operating system and to basically load and run that operating system and bring it to the point where you can work and interact with it. Likewise, they all have a shutdown function. Now the shutdown function is important, and uh, I'll mention it now and you probably hear me say it again, is that it's a controlled turning off of your computer. By controlled, what it means is that your operating system is going to make sure that anything that uh, needs to be written to the hard drive before you shut it down is going to be shut down, or, or written to the hard drive, I should say, so that we don't get, end up with getting corrupted files. And I haven't talked about the hardware internally so much, and we'll talk about that at the end of this module. But the uh, process of doing a lot of the functions is uh, storing information in what we call memory. Uh, some people call it random access memory. There's different varieties of RAM as we talk about it. But RAM is the type of memory that if it doesn't have power, the data that's stored there will disappear. Unlike your hard drive. As long as the, you write the changes to the hard drive, you can take the power away and that information is still magnetically written onto the, uh, into that hard drive so it's still there when you turn it back on again. Well, the problem was if you just pulled the plug and they called that your shutdown, all of the information in memory would just disappear. And some of that might have to have been stored so the next time you turn on the computer, those files that the, the operating system requires are, are the correct files and that you don't end up with what we call file corruption. So they all have a shutdown feature to safely turn off a computer. Now once you're working with a computer and, uh, and you think about uh, security issues, uh, you know, if you have your home computer or your home laptop and you're um, working with uh, your own personal data, maybe you've got some credit card information or purchase history or medical files, and you've got to think to yourself, what happens if I walk away from that computer? Well, and you walk away from it, uh, what's going to happen is that your screen is still on and people walking up to your computer would be able to access your data. I mean, if they know how to use an operating system, everything is there. So many of the operating systems have a feature called locking or lock. And what a lock does is it turns off the interactive screen, the windows that you would use, until somebody can provide the correct password to be able to bring that back open. And so that's why it's called locking. Now, you might say, well, why don't I just shut it down? Well, if you shut it down, all the information you were working on will also go away. I mean, hopefully it'll shut down and store it on the hard drive, but then you'd have to reopen all your programs and uh, get back to where you were. When you lock a computer's operating system, all of those programs are still working in the background. They haven't gone away. 
When you unlock it by supplying your, uh, your uh, username and password, or maybe a PIN number, or uh, whatever mechanism you use to log in, that information is still there in the same spot you left it. And so it was made it very easy for you to be able to uh, you know, leave, know that everything's secure, come back and be able to immediately go back to work or being productive. Now, in some cases, you have devices that are requiring battery life or battery power. Your portable devices, again, a laptop or a tablet, some of those natures. So there's another feature that is uh, something important that also, if you set it up right, will require a password to get back in. That feature is called Hibernate. Now, what Hibernate does is it basically takes all of the contents in memory, you know, that, that the uh, storage location where if there's no power, the data is lost. And it takes that and actually stores that information on your hard drive. And you know what's in that memory? That memory is uh, basically keeping track of what windows looked like when you were connected, which applications were open, which web pages you were on, uh, what uh, data you'd been typing into the application. All of that's stored on a hard drive. And that way, when you take the power out, and you lose that information in the memory, it's still on the hard drive. Now what happens is that you don't have to, when you turn it back on, wait for the longer process of the machine doing the initial startup, initial load of the, of the operating system, and finally getting the operating system to run. What happens is it just simply has to take that information on the hard drive, put it back into memory, redraw the screen the way it was when you left, and that way you're back to work in a very quick manner. So, and it is, by the way, very fast, but by being in hibernation mode, you're not utilizing any of your battery power. Now, there's also another option where you may have computers that are being used by more than one person. And so what we have is a feature of log on and log off. Now, again, the idea of logging on is uh, basically the same as what you would do when you first start up a machine, uh, start up any operating system. You have to log on to that computer with a username and password. At least most often, that's what we see, especially now in Windows 8, where uh, we see more emphasis on security, even more than we saw with Windows 7. But if I'm done for the day, and I don't want to shut down the computer, and I don't need to hibernate the computer, but I don't want people using my account, you can log off. By logging off, you'll close the applications that you were working on, unlike hibernate that would actually keep them uh, you know, available the next time you turned it on or, uh, and brought the power back. But that way, another person can come in after you. They can have their own log on and not have access to your information. Now, these features, like I said, are common with most every operating system. But it's important that you understand that even though I'm doing a focus on Windows 7 and Windows 8, that uh, there are other operating systems that are available to you. A very popular uh, brand of operating system is called Linux, L-I-N-U-X. Now, Linux does have a command line interface. That's primarily what it's known for. And a lot of people who are really into uh, the programming world like this type of uh, interface. But it also has what's called an X window, which brings up a graphical user interface that has a lot of look and feel like your operating system with Microsoft. Obviously, the world of Apple has their own operating systems and also has a command line interface. And that's another popular one. Now, again, it will have consistency from versions of uh, applications running on the Macintosh uh, operating system, the Mac OS, that uh, will be different, though, than the look and feel of Windows. So when I talk about the consistency, what I'm getting at is if you choose to use Windows, if you choose to use Linux, if you choose to use the Macintosh operating system, that the applications will all look and feel the same on that one operating system. So everything I launch in a Macintosh system is going to have the same method of closing the windows, of making them larger, of resizing them, uh, at, just like in Windows. Everything I open will have that same look and feel. And that's what's important about an operating system is that it gives you that consistency, not necessarily between the different vendors, but for the programs you run on those systems. The directory infrastructure is what we call the uh, way in which we store and organize our files. We start off with a container that we often call a folder. Now, the folder itself doesn't contain data. It is designed as a placeholder. Now, I don't draw very good pictures of folders, but that would be my folder. And uh, we'll call it uh, my documents folder. And within that folder, I might choose to have a number of subfolders. Because if these are all my documents, I'm going to imagine that I make more than one type of document. 
that I might actually have some documents that uh, maybe uh, contain uh, personal information like a resume. Uh, or I might have another folder in here to organize all of my uh, spreadsheets uh, that uh, I create. Or another folder that uh, has all of my databases. Because it's easier with organization, uh, I'll call this Access because that's one of the programs that uh, is a database program. So we call them folders or containers because uh, we're just organizing our data. What's important to know is that we can find things if we are pretty well organized by going to the top level folder and then when we open it we'll see all of these bottom level or subfolders that are in there and uh, and I'll put org because that's what we're doing with those is organizing things and then within those folders we might actually see the actual files that are listed and hopefully if you have good organizational skills that they're all of the same type that makes sense with that folder and that way you have the ability to easily find information that you need now we know sometimes you might store a file in the wrong folder. That can certainly happen. Or you might decide, maybe I need to reclassify it. So the other nice thing about the directory infrastructure, or about the operating system especially, is the ease in which you can move your data around. So moving the data is one thing. Moving the data means that you're going to take an actual file and uh, take that original file and move it to another folder. By moving, what I'm saying is I'm removing it from the Access subfolder and putting it into the Sheets or the Spreadsheets subfolder. Now, that's different than a copy. A copy leaves the original and makes a copy of that file so that you now have that same file inside your destination. You basically have two of them. They're just in different locations. So uh, we call that a copy. Now, moving is very much the same as the cut operation, and most of you probably know it by cut and paste. Uh, in fact, that's another part of the function here, is that if you do copy something, you have to decide where you're going to paste that copy. And so, uh, when you cut a file, that's the same thing as, again, as removing it from where it is, and moving it, pasting it, put a paste over here, into the new location. So, uh, you could say that the move function is the function of both copy and paste. Now, I have to tell you that it's so much easier to do that graphically than what it took for us to do it in the command line. In the command line, you'd have to use a command like copy. Well, that doesn't sound so hard. But then you'd have to put the full path of all the folders you had to go through to be able to get to that file. And then you had to put in the new place where you wanted that file to be located. And so it, that meant that if you didn't know their names, you had to stop what you're doing, do a lot of uh, change directories and directory commands. And, you know, that's why I was talking about the fact that the operating system might actually be doing several commands behind the scenes for you to be able to uh, give you that functionality that you don't have to worry about. Now, most of the structure, the infrastructure of these directories, uh, are going to give you a search feature. So if you decide, well, I don't remember how I classified a document, but I need to find it, you could do a search and tell your operating system something specific to search for. Like if you know you had something called My Spreadsheet and you just don't remember where it is, then you could do that search at a top-level folder, and that search would go through all of the folders down below until it found one or more of those uh, files that have those words in it, My Spreadsheet. Of course, if it didn't find any of those, you wouldn't see any results. So again, it makes it easy to find data. And that's also important because uh, we don't want to be sitting there taking hours trying to uh, take care of this entire process. Now, one of the early security things that I want to talk about, and I'm just bringing it up now. You'll see some examples of how this is done. But one of the early things that I want you to know about security is that your data is very important to you and you don't want it to ever be taken from you. And how could it be taken? Well, here's an example. Many people have laptops. And uh, these laptops contain inside of them a hard drive that is all of your data. And a lot of times, if you're working out in a public arena or maybe you are um, uh, you know, got it locked in the car, whatever the case is, uh, some people try to secure it. They may, they may try to uh, add passwords so that you just can't log in. Or some places actually sell uh, like a little padlock that you can uh, hook onto the uh, laptop and tie it down on a table somewhere. And, uh, you know, i got to tell you, as a, a person who works in the hacking arena, if I wanted your data 
I don't care where your laptop is. I don't care if you lock it down because all I need to do is smash it open and steal your hard drive. Once I steal your hard drive, I can hook it up to my Windows computer and look at all of your data. So encryption or encrypting files is a very important function for the security of your data. In fact, if you, as you move further and further into uh, the, the uh, ideas of security, you'll see that we tell you that your, your information should be encrypted both when it's in motion and at rest. What does it mean at rest? When it's stored on the hard drive, it's at rest. What does it mean if it's in motion? If you take your file and decide to send it out through an email to somebody, is it uh, encrypted so that if anybody intercepts it, that they would be able to read your data? That would be the in motion part. Now, I mentioned this with NTFS. There's many other ways, but that's a free encryption feature that you have uh, with uh, a variety of different Windows operating systems. And it's very important uh, to know that you can uh, add that level of encryption with your files. All right, another uh, part of what we do in the directory infrastructure is we worry about how much space we have on our hard drive. And, uh, and so we try to find ways to get this amount of storage room to increase. Now, that was especially uh, true many years ago. Many years ago, I remember when we had what was a size of a 20 megabyte hard drive. Now, by today's standards, one big Word document with pictures and graphics could be the size of uh, that entire hard drive. We're measuring things in so, many, uh, so much larger storage. So obviously, I was talking about even in the uh, mid-90s that we had so little room. So compression was another way of saving our, uh, or reducing the size of a file. Just as uh, an idea of behind what compression would be, is we looked at your documents, and if we saw, you know, I'm, I'm not going to write a full letter here, but uh, just a series of, uh, you know, we're looking at your text files, and uh, maybe we see um, uh, a common uh, set of, uh, of uh, character strings. I'm just writing nonsense here. Uh, and so what compression did is it looked for patterns. It said, oh, look, here's a pattern of ABC that is repeated a couple of times. So you know what it did is it said, all right, let's uh, put a, a variable. Let's uh, just put a variable, uh, we'll call it the variable number one, and replace the number one for ABC. So instead of having three characters there, I have just one character. And then I create a little chart that says everywhere you see that symbol number one, replace it with ABC. So when you open the file, the decompression would recreate it the same way as it uh, originally looked. And we can see those same patterns in the middle of uh, pictures and images. Uh, and so it's a way of just being able to reduce the size that we need for um, storing a file on a hard drive. It also made it faster for us to send as an attachment. Because it's a smaller file, it uh, can be sent faster. It doesn't take as much bandwidth to be able to send that information. And, uh, but it's, you know, again, I'm getting a little outside of the directory infrastructure. But what I'm talking about is that we can encrypt files that we create, and we can compress files that we create, all as a part of uh, how we manage the uh, directory infrastructure and the storage within our uh, computers. So you probably think, boy, I, I've heard you already enough on this hardware issue. But let's make sure we have a good understanding. Hardware is something you can usually physically see and touch. Uh, kind of the idea that if uh, you can grab it and throw it out the window and it breaks, it's hardware. Of course, then it's brokenware at that point. But there's a number of different types of uh, hardware devices, and they all have different functions. I've only been representing printers so far as a uh, device where we have output from our computer. Now, remember, I like to draw the laptops, and uh, there's the operating system running on that computer. Well, other things come out of a computer besides the request to print. Obviously, we might have uh, information coming out to a speaker. Uh, so we can have sound that comes out and uh, plays our uh, music files or whether uh, we're uh, you know, streaming videos or just wanting to hear the uh, operating system make bings and bongs as you uh, make mistakes with the uh, different commands that are out there. Uh, other types of hardware, you know, we didn't talk about those of you who are in the gaming world who uh, might have, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, hopefully that looks like a, one of those Xbox type of pads uh, for uh, joysticks uh, that you might be using. All of these are examples of hardware. And hardware is designed to facilitate the idea of I.O., input, output. So what I've shown you here right now is a couple of examples 
of hardware that was designed for output. Output would, of course, being that uh, we're sending information from the operating system. Now, some of you might have a microphone. And uh, so, you know, here's a microphone on one of those stands there. Uh, or, of course, uh, the uh, famous keyboard and uh, pointing device, which is uh, what we often call the mouse uh, that we would use to uh, connect. And those would be examples of input types of devices. And, uh, and that's because, you know, we're going to send sound in or we're going to send signals in about what we're uh, clicking on in the operating system. And as I said, all of these hardware devices have to be able to talk to the operating system. And that's why I'm re-emphasizing the idea of drivers, is that it's a way of communicating to the operating system. And remember that the software applications that you use are communicating to the operating system as well. That means that you personally only have to click a button to play a musical song, uh, and you don't have to enter any commands that tells the operating system how to talk to that speaker. That's what the driver does. It translates all of that. Now, I just want to give you another security issue. I believe security should be something we think about from day one in anything we do with uh, this digital technology. I say that as a person who does a lot of work in that security realm, and yet even I, a week ago, had uh, my bank call me to tell me that somebody had somehow uh, swiped my uh, debit card number and started opening up uh, an online Yahoo wallet with it. Fortunately, they caught it before I did and uh, stopped that entire process. So we, no matter how much you do with security, it's important to hear this. You're going to eventually get to a point where you're going to buy a new piece of hardware and you're going to need to download a driver. And downloading a driver means that maybe you lost the CD or the DVD-ROM that the driver was on. And so when you download these drivers, uh, what you need to know is that many of them need to be what's called digitally signed. Digital signing is a way of guaranteeing that the program, the driver that you're download, downloading, came from the manufacturer and wasn't something that some evil hacker out there uh, tried to pretend was a driver in the effort to uh, take over your computer and to earn your or to uh, steal your uh, personal information. So we look at that and Windows is very good at giving you a warning if something you are downloading has not been signed, in other words verified, that it came from the actual uh, manufacturer or vendor of uh, the hardware device that you're using. Again, the idea of having a graphical user interface, the idea of Windows, was to give you consistency and to be able to basically reduce, as I said, the cost of what it took to develop applications. We want any application you open to have consistency in how you manage that application running. Now, inside of each application, they may have different functions, different buttons, because obviously a spreadsheet is different than a database, is different than a letter that you're writing. Um, but, and so they'll have commands inside the application, but we want that consistency. And that's what the graphical user interface, we call it the GUI, gives you. And as I mentioned, for those of you who have an idea that you might want to get further into things, uh, the command line interface still exists on almost every operating system that I've seen. But that's where you're typing commands and not clicking on anything to uh, make that happen in the background. Now, one of the things that I want you to understand is how to navigate through Windows and to be able to change things about Windows to make it easier for you. And what I'm going to introduce to you is this area called the control panel. Now, the control panel is something you'll probably come across, and it allows you to change settings, potentially security settings, such as whether or not you want to use the Windows firewall or this really cool thing called the Windows Defender, which was designed to prevent viruses and spyware from infecting your computer. Or maybe you just don't like the way your mouse feels when you move it on the mouse pad. Now, I'm not saying we're going to make it feel different on the mouse pad, but you know, if you move uh, your hand uh, from one edge of the mouse pad to the other edge, did the mouse go all the way across the screen or did it just move a couple of inches? Some people like to speed that up so they don't have to move their hand as much. Or maybe they want to change the button combination because they're left-handed and not right-handed, which is how the mouse was originally designed. Uh, and these are examples of things you can do in the control panel to make things better and to make uh, hopefully more efficient for you. Uh, another common interface that we see is the web browser. 
Again, the idea of a web browser was to present a window that has a consistent look and feel, like your operating systems, for all of the websites that you go to. And we'll certainly uh, give you an introduction and show you uh, some of the basics use of, uh, basic usage of the web browser to be able to search for uh, different websites, to be able to uh, go uh, back to an old website or to store a website as a place you can come back to later when you, uh, in case you forget whether that website is. So we're going to show you some of those features. But again, regardless of which page you go to, the idea is, is that we want you to be able to uh, know how to navigate so that it doesn't matter what is the content on the page, but where it's located and how to get to it and how to be able to move around. Now I'm going to revisit the directory. That was the directory infrastructure. The way in which we store your information through the containers we called folders or the subfolders. And, uh, and again, like I said, that's kind of up to your organizational skills. What you're going to see when we get into Windows 7 is they have a tool called Windows Explorer. It got renamed to File Explorer in Windows 8, but it gives you the same capability. And remember, the idea was is it helps you organize your information to be able to give you search features and even options about how to see those files. If you have like a folder filled with a bunch of your uh, personal photographs, you can make it so that when you're looking at the list of files or pictures, that instead of it just being the name of a picture, that it can be a little icon that has kind of a small shrunken down version of what that picture is. I mean, the actual picture. It's kind of like, you know, you might have a beautiful landscape photo and now it looks like a little wallet size, but it makes it easy for you to be able to search and find and view your information. Now, I do want you to know there are some things in uh, the directory infrastructure in some very important locations, um, like in the Windows folder, that will have files and folders that are technically there, but you're not supposed to see them. You actually have the ability to unhide these files and folders, but I just want to tell you the reason they're hidden is to protect you from deleting them and making your operating system crash. So don't be surprised sometimes if uh, you, know, you come across a hidden file or folder. I'll certainly show you through your view options how you can see them if you want to. I'll also show you how to be able to look at those extensions that I talked about and the importance again of those extensions to uh, link them with the uh, programs or the applications that are stored on your operating system. Now, over time, the different operating systems, including Windows, are going to have new features, and those features are going to come to you in the form of updates. Now, you may see and come across messages that tells you sometimes that there are new updates to install. The updates, as I said, were designed to either fix a problem that might have occurred, what we call a bug. Uh, the idea, I guess, is that uh, it, you know, the bug gets into the system, uh, or, you know, bug if you're making a cake batter and a bug gets in, it kind of ruins the whole batter. Uh, those bugs, those un, uh, unwanted features, uh, is another way to put it uh, in a hopefully funny way, uh, can be fixed through updates, uh, as well as, as I said, adding new features. Now, in some cases, there may be worse bugs that we call a vulnerability. That means it's a weakness that was discovered in the operating system that if a hacker took advantage of that weakness, that they could take over your system and steal your information. So you'll also see a series of patches coming out periodically from a company like Microsoft to be able to make the repairs to those uh, vulnerabilities. And so it's important that you understand that updates and patches are something you need to keep up on as you're working with your operating system so that you can stay safe and get the benefits of the new features and potentially get rid of uh, problems, the bugs that are in the operating system. Sometimes they come in the uh, form of what's called a hot fix, which means it's uh, trying to fix a specific little bug. Uh, you install the software and then you're done and that problem will, be go will basically be gone. Come